We are pleased to welcome Nancy Moran, Senior Pediatric Clinician, Behavioral Health and Cognitive Therapy at Summit Medical Group. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. So many young people dealing with or their parents are concerned about mm -hmm. anxiety. Talk about depression in a second. Define anxiety. Anxiety, we define anxiety as an overestimation of the danger and an underestimation of one's ability to cope with it. So it's worry. It's thinking that the world is a dangerous place, the world is unpredictable, and I might not be able to handle it. Depression is? Depression is more of a mood disorder. Depression is sadness, could be loss of interest, could go along with fatigue, loss of appetite, changes in sleep pattern. What they can go together, but... So, sorry for interrupting, Nancy. Why do so many people, at least the ones that I talk to, when talking about younger people and, and adolescents, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, they throw it together, they throw them together. They're not necessarily together, but they can be, mm -hmm. co they can coexist. Correct. These are often co-occurring disorders. Um, I think that a person who worries for a long period of time, feels anxious in their life all the time, can become really down and sad about that. Why does it seem, and I could be wrong, why does it seem that there are more and more young people either being diagnosed with anxiety mm -hmm. um, or we perceive that there are more? Which one is it, by the way? We definitely are seeing an increase in anxiety disorders, um, not as much as the increase in depression. Um, and we can make some guesses as to why that might be. Certainly social media is a factor. We are hearing... How so? I think that kids don't get a chance to unplug. They're constantly tuned into what's happening with their peers. They're constantly feeling that they have to compare themselves to others. And there's a lot of pressure associated with that. How many um, likes? Who's checking me out? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? There's mm -hmm. a young woman we know who, frankly, was posting some pictures uh, on, on a social media site, I'm not going to say, who was making sure, was trying to make sure that the pictures that she was posting, she was confident would get a lot of likes. Right. Which may not have been consistent with what she should be presenting to the world. Correct. Or her parents wanted her to present to the world. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Also, we're hearing from kids that the academic world is more competitive, feels more competitive. But I think the most important factor to talk about, because it's the one that we can control, is that it seems as though we live in a more dangerous world. We almost have become a fearful society. I don't know if it's because we have a constant newsreel. Mm -hmm. Every terrible thing that happens is on our, pinged on our phone. Um, but as a result, parents are much more inclined to provide a lot of protections to kids. And so this means that kids are getting that subtle message that they're not safe in the world. And they're also not getting opportunities to figure out how to cope and how to learn strategies for dealing with adversity. So I think that over time creates an anxious child. Advice for parents. This is a, the good news is that parents can definitely help the situation from a young age when your child starts expressing worry or wanting to resist situations that seem uncomfortable, such as a birthday party or even a soccer practice. If you acknowledge your child's feelings, support them, but then encourage them to face that situation anyway. The most natural thing in, a wor in the world for a parent to do is to reassure your child and say, you're going to be OK. I'll help you through it. And while that seems like a helpful thing in the moment, in the long run, it makes a child feel less capable of working it out on their own. Mm. So the better approach is to, once you've acknowledged your child's feelings, talk it through with them. Ask them, how do you think you could deal with that if the worst thing happened? We've talked to some of our, my wife and I talked to some of the, our, the other parents. We all talk about our kids a lot, right? Mm -hmm. We're not the only ones. Sure. Want our kid to go to the best school. Got to get ready for the SAT. Got to get ready for the ACT. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't go to that great school, whether it's Ivy League or wherever else, you know, mm -hmm. things aren't going to work out for the kid. And that kid is told that. Our kid didn't get into the special, advanced, whatever the course is. Mm -hmm. The kid knows that. Mm -hmm. Am I making too much of this stuff? It's there. It's real. But I think it's important to have the conversation to say, yeah, sometimes things don't work out the way you wanted them to. Now what? But what about putting pressure on the kid to get into that? Look, 
I'm trying to find the balance between having high standards, mm -hmm. um, expecting the most from our young, mm -hmm. from our kids, mm -hmm. but then putting so much pressure on them that, they're, that it's not healthy for them. To me, the difference is that you have a high standard versus an unrelenting standard. So meaning, do you strive to be the very best that you can be, but it's okay if you only make it 90% of the way, or is there a very fixed and rigid outcome that is a must? When it's an unrelenting standard, there's a tremendous pressure. Too much. Too much. Too much. And, um, by the way, let's run this all the way to, to, to the end of the show, if we could. Um, because there's so much to talk about here. You got me curious, and more importantly, you got a lot of people watching right now. So, screen time. Go back to how you talked about screen time. Now I'm sitting there going, you want to limit screen time. Mm -hmm. We have an eight-year-old, two teenagers, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Different, do you recommend that parents set screen times, enforcing it's another story, set screen times based on is age appropriate screen time? 100%. The American Pediatric Association is recommending two hours a day. Kids are seeing way more and more, way more than that. Um, absolutely, you have to monitor screen time. You have to put timers on. You have to designate times of the day where it's appropriate. You also have to monitor what they're doing on the screens. How do you do that? There's parental control. You have to be savvy. You have to be sa savvy with the technology. And I actually am a big advocate for holding out as long as possible to give that first cell phone. And when you do, having there be a contract. Hold on a second. We'll do the contract in a second. Okay. We did this. I know some other parents uh, have done this. You know, got the phone for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Got to make sure you can communicate with them. Mm -hmm. You don't disagree with that. Correct. But there's another side to that, isn't there? Right. That phone belongs to you. You're loaning it to your child for the purposes of his or her safety. You, res you reserve the right to check in and make sure that they're using it safely. You reserve the right to be their friend on social media up to a certain point. You know, this is when they're, they're learning. There are training wheels that have to go with this. And as your child grows and shows that they can handle it, they can use good judgment, you know, you can release some of those controls. So an eight-year-old versus a 16-year-old in terms of how you monitor it, same, different, or are there uh, privacy issues? No, it to it's totally different, totally different. An eight-year-old doesn't have privacy. A 16-year-old, if they've shown good judgment, can begin to have some privacy. But only after they've demonstrated that they can use good judgment, the pressure, on social media, and you're in your own little world, you know, you're down a rabbit hole and you forget. It's very easy. The best of kids have exercised poor judgment. And real quick on this, um, we've got about a minute and a half left. What I'm curious about is, we're not the only ones as parents. Your, your kid is on a screen, mm -hmm. he or she is busy, you're getting some peace and quiet, and you go, hey, mm -hmm. listen, right. Right. I'm not going to question this. Right. That's too lazy, isn't it? Well, listen, I shouldn't say lazy, but it's yeah. not the best approach. But it, it's realistic. Yes, you know, that's why I, I think, put it out there. I think that's what happens in families. And, and also, I'm not saying screens are terrible and awful and we should never have them. But, you know, kids, kids deserve a little downtime and they can do something enjoyable or even educational. But it's just that it's limited and it's monitored. You know, it's so interesting. We were talking about 8-year-old, 16-year-old, but also our initiative put up, if we could, Nicole, our Right from the Start NJ initiative deals with... Uh, how we can help infants and toddlers. Mm -hmm. It's relevant there as well. They should not be on it at all. Say, say that again. In, infants and toddlers, up to three. I think it's up to two that they're very concerned about the neurological development of a child. Important stuff. This is, uh, boy, you've given us a lot to think about. And I'm not the only one as a parent. Nancy Moran, who is senior pediatric clinician, behavioral health and cognitive therapy at Summit Medical Group. And we are colleagues and friends with the folks over there, and they support our programming as well at Summit. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm Steve Adubato. Let's continue the conversation. So be sure you let us know exactly what topics you think that we should be covering on Think Tank. So check me out on Twitter, at Steve Adubato. But way more importantly, make sure you think for yourself. See you next week.